Last time uh, I gave you a little background about uh, the seasons as were presented by Kalidas, the complete cycle of the year. And I think this is the only place in the entire English literature where the seasons are fully described. Fully described. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a uh, fundamental difference between the approach of Kalidas and the approach of Shevendu. You immediately see that in the case of Kalidas, the description is a post lyrical, very sweet, very enchanting, very absorbing also, but it borders on the sensuous almost at times on the erotic. In contrast to that, in Savitri, it lifts you up to a different psycho-spiritual status, the whole description. And it has also the mystical connotation. It is not season for the sake of season, but mm -hmm. the entire spiritual, evolutionary possibility which is present in time, it is that which kind of gets summed up in this description. That is one point. Well, I mean, uh, let me, for the sake of uh, briefness, tell you that in the case of uh, Kalidas, we have in all 144 stanzas of the seasons and there are long descriptions which run into several pages there. Mm. Whereas in uh, Savitri, the descriptions are somewhat uneven. See, the uh, length which is given to each season mm. is not the same, it is very uneven. Uh, the opening season, summer, is described in just four lines. In contrast to that, the next season, rain, has 44 lines. Then these next three seasons, autumn, winter, and frost, they are all sort of disposed of <laughs> in 24 lines. But the place of pride goes to spring and it has 47 lines, you know. So the description is really not even in that sense, the 44 lines of spring. Now, uh, therefore we have, as far as the seasons are concerned, in all 108, 119 lines. Total number of lines for the seasons, six seasons is 119 lines. Plus the introductory part, introducing the season, uh, has a description of 19 lines or in other words the total canto, the total section described the season runs into 138 lines total season in all. Now uh, as a little example before we proceed with the text here I have picked up from Kalidas's Ruta uh, Samhara. Ruta Samhara. Samhara means collection of season or the pageant of season. Ruta means season. Actually, the word Ruta has a, a deeper Vedic significance. It is a rhythm of time in the transcendent, which is what Ruta means. The rhythm of time in the transcendent. The rhythm, you see. Means uh, it is the moment of truth in its own domain of truth. That is what truth means. It means, Ritu means. In fact, there is a difference, as I told you last time, between truth and right. The word which is used for uh, Ritu in English is at times right. Truth and right. Uh, or in Sanskrit, Satya, Satyam and Ritam. Mm -hmm. uh, satyam is a kind of a static aspect of the truth of its existence. 
that is satyam whereas rutam is the dynamic aspect of the transcendent so the moment is what comes out in the rutu so from that word rutu the word rutu samhar or seasons comes here or rutam comes in our daily language you see so here uh, uh, when kalidas is describing well the date of kalidas is a little uncertain we cannot really pin down to what period he belonged but uh, roughly we can say that <coughs> he belongs to what is called a classical age of sanskrit literature about 1500 years ago around 500 or so that period is seen and at that time the sanskrit poetry had gone through numerous stages and it had come to the lyrical and sensuous level earlier we had the vedic poetry then we had the upanishadic poetry then we had the puranic poetry like that it went through numerous stages and during the kalidasa period we see that there is a sudden bursting of the lyrical aspect of poetry in sanskrit and that is what we got he is the master of that similes descriptions and all that is now i will just read first uh, what he speaks about this summer kalidas in fact i will give his stanza it is a very good translation in english by somebody uh, who know new sanskrit very well and who is a poet also in english <laughs> and that was perhaps about 100 years ago by one of the indologist i don't have his name here he has been at and this translation of the text of samar in uh, english now the first opening stanza of the summer the word for summer uh, is grishma in sanskrit grishma and it means very really hot you see grishma so this is the word itself has that connotation of heat now he then translates it like this pitiless heat from heaven pours that is the summer pitiless heat from heaven pours by day during the day the pitiless heat flows from heaven but nice are cool that is the contrast not in pondicherry but in the <laughs> in the interior you see you see pondicherry were covered by the sea you see <laughs> so pitiless heat from heaven pours by day but nights are cool continual breathing gently lows because of the heat you constantly keep on breathing taking bath in the pool of in the pond or whatever it is it's constant continual breathing gently lows the water in the pool the level of water goes down <laughs> because of constant <laughs> <laughs> constant breathing <you> see <laughs> the uh, evening brings a charming peace is true in the interior the evenings are really very charming you go and sleep on the terrace and very pleasant look at the stars and sky <laughs> like that the uh, evening brings a charming peace for summer time is here this is what happens in the summer time man love that never knows surcease surcease means we never know the end love that never knows surcease is less imperious dear is not so powerful so well made in the night so already you can see the sensuous element entering into the poetic description he has done a very good translation on the whole i must say that and all rhymed lines you see pitiless he from heaven pours but day but nights are cool continually breathing gently lows the water in the pool the evening brings a charming peace for summer time is here when love that never knows surcease is less imperious dear he is addressing to his beloved in fact the whole ruta samhar in the description of the lover to his beloved it goes on in the story see he describes all the seasons in the manner you see now in contrast to that we have a very different sort of a description in savitri now first let us read that and then we we'll go back
the, the one 93.6 opening sentence, what opening stanza. Yeah, uh, that is what uh, all the summary is about, isn't it? <laughs> Savitri, see. Across the burning languor of the soil, this summer, which is pomp of violent noons, and stamped his tyranny your torrid light, and the blue seal of a great burnished sky. Suddenly you can see the difference in poetry. <laughs> Don't you feel that? <laughs> you feel a difference suddenly you see that. Across the burning languor of the soil, soil is listless, without any activity. Across the burning languor is because of hot heat, summer heat. Pace summer is moving fast. Pace summer, which is pomp of violent noons, one after the other, noons are coming and they are following the summer in that way. Pomp of violent noon and stamped his tyranny. Yes, I am here, I am here, I am here. That is what the summer is saying all the while, tyranny. Stamped his tyranny of torrid light and the blue sea of a great burnished sky. The sky is as if polished, buffed, very clear, mm -hmm. see, buffed, you see, burnished sky. Blue sea is all blue, there are no clouds, nothing. So this is the sort of description you have in Savitri. Mm -hmm. now, before coming to summer, we have these introductory lines. Let us quickly go back to the beginning and read them. <laughs> A minute of the cycles of desire. Around the light she must not dare to touch, hastening towards a far of unknown goal. Earth followed the endless journey of the sun. As I told you last time, it is the capital sun. So this is at once you can see a mystical image. Earth and sun, they are tied together. Now of course, there is something uh, interesting from the astronomical point of view. See, the, until recent times, before Newton, people were all the while saying that it is the sun which moves around the earth. <laughs> Heliocentric, you see, that, see, it is the sun, geocentric, <coughs> it is the sun which moves around the earth. And Bible went to such an extent that it ostracized everybody who opposed that view until then. Then later on came Newton and he says, no, it is the earth which moves around the sun, the planetary system, and the whole thing fell into places, the astronomical observations. But comes Shevendo and he says that it is neither the sun which moves around the earth, nor the earth moving around the sun. They move around each other. <laughs> <laughs> You can't say this or that, you see, they move around each other. This is what we have here, earth and sun. When he's describing that, it is that kind of a thing. In other words, there is a sort of an intimate relationship between the two. Although astronomically, it may look to you like that, there is a sort of an intimate relationship between the two, that through that moment, something is going to be achieved. It is a purposeful moment of their relationship also and it is that which is being carried forward in time. Time in the cyclic manner, in the periodic manner, going round and round and round and round. Because it is through the cycles that the things will move forward. This whole idea. So it is it is actually the relationship between earth and the sun. You know, in that little book, The Mother, she even do makes a remark Earth is a significant center. The phrase which is used is significant center of the universe. Significant center of the universe. The word is significant center. Now obviously we know, of course through him and <laughs> through the mother, <laughs> that that significant center is because in the entire material creation, the whole cosmos, material world, galaxies and galaxies and galaxies. It is only on earth that 
due to the presence of the psychic being. Her itself or herself had the psychic being. And it is that which indeed makes her a significant center. So if you see from that angle, indeed it is the sun which is moving around the earth. <laughs> because it is, it is the significant, it is a psychic thing which has to move forward, it has to move on also, you see. If you see from that uh, metaphysical point of view, spiritual point of view, from the occult angle, it is, it is a psychic being which has to move forward, has to evolve and go. And when he is describing now the seasons, it is the aspect of that psychic development of evolution being carried forward, which is to be seen uh, in the entire passage here. I mean, therefore, urge in a frenzy, like a woman, a minard, as you say, you see. <laughs> a minard, the cycles of desire around the lie, she must not lie, she must not dare to touch. Hastening towards a far of unknown goal, urge followed the endless journey of the sun. It is the sunlit path which the earth is following. So it is really the sunlit path of the psychic being. A mind, but half awake, in the swing with a void. Now, in the swain with a void, he is immediately telling you in one single phrase how the whole thing has come into existence here. It is from the void, from nothing, from the inconscience. In fact, inconscience is a much greater and a richer state than the absolute void. You imagine something totally absent to begin with. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Shunya, I would call it. Out of that, something has happened and inconscience came into existence. So, inconscience itself is, in a certain sense, the first evolutionary manifestation of things to happen here. Out of inconscience then came matter, then other things, life, mind, and etc., etc. This is what it means. So, he says, swaying with the void, out of that things have started happening here. In other words, the entire metaphysical uh, connotation is present in the single phrase. A mind but half awake, this is what we are. We are in a half awake state, mental state. On the bosom of the inconscious dreamed out life and bore this finite world of thought and deed across the immobile trance of the infinite. Immobile trance of the infinite. He is lying there, static, without any activity, the infinite, infinite. And out of that, this moment has started taking place of mind, of life, and further on, later on. So, in one stanza, in four lines, he has swept through the entire course of evolution. State of evolution you see. And both the finite world of thought and deed across the immobile trance of the infinite, he has taken the position. In fact, according to the uh, Indian tradition, it is Vishnu he himself has taken the position in the inconscience. He is lying there on a thousand hooded serpent. That is the iconographical description of Vishnu. Thousand footed serpent is there and he is resting on that. He must have seen those things, perhaps some images. Now, obviously, there are also uh, mystical images, they are full of you know, connotations. Thousand footed serpent, serpent is energy, and it has thousand aspects of manifestation of energy. It is on that. He is resting. And it is that which then becomes the base for further things to happen. Because he is present there, the evolution is possible. In, in the mother's world, she says that there is a total void. And when the horror of this void was seen, she says, she used the word, the horror of this void was seen. The Supreme plunged into it. 
the Supreme plunged into it. And it is he who has stationed himself in the void. He is that inconscient Vishnu. Or what the mother calls it, he is the avatar. The first avatar is the Supreme's plunge into the void. And that avatar then becomes the base for all these further things to happen in the course of evolution. Had that not happened, evolution would not have been possible. That is what it means basically. Now, how the horror takes place, why? That is another aspect of the story. <laughs> 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 that means not going to let you see. So no. <laughs> that she has narrated also in what she calls the story of creation. You see, she has narrated that mm. also, you see. But that is another aspect. Maybe in another context we can come back to that thing, you see. But try the moment, let us assume that it is so. In fact, she goes one step farther, the mother. It is the Supreme who has plunged into the horror. She calls that presence of the Supreme in the horror as the first avatar. And then she goes further and says, yes, he is Satyavan. She says, he is Satyavan who is seated in that horror there. But does she say that? Yeah, yes, she says that. Satyavan, he is there. And the entire story of Savitri then becomes sort of clear. It is Savitri who is going to rescue Satyavan from that condition. He is now in the grip of that, in the grip of death. And the only thing, only one who can release him from the grip is the divine Shakti, divine power, divine force, divine himself as a feminine who can come and do that. And therefore Savitri's coming here is in that context to remove the grip of death which is there on the soul of Satyavan. So, uh, all these things is indirectly or indirectly, you see, you have to have all that background when you are reading these lines because they, they are uh, connotative of all those significances, you see. A mind of half, a mind half awake in the swaying of the void on the bosom of inconscience, dreamed out life and bore this finite world of thought and deed across the immobile trance or infinite. See, immobile trance or infinite is, uh, these are very pregnant phrases. Mm -hmm. it, it means all those things, now you see. A vast immutable silence ran with her. So, earth is moving in the sky, in the open spaces, in the Akash. All silent, there is no activity as such in the name. A vast immutable silence with her ran. Prisoner of speed, Upon a jeweled wheel, she communed with a mystic heart in space. She has identified herself with this creation, with space and time. She herself is in time and she is identifying in space. So, the divine soul in the nature of evolution, who has taken the form of the earth, it is that which is now present in space and time. She communed with a mystic heart in space amid the ambiguous stillness of the stars. Now this is the picture of the whole sky for the beginning. Amid the ambiguous stillness of the stars, she moved towards some undisclosed event. Earth is moving constantly. She does not know, so to say, at the moment where she is going, what she is going to achieve. She has no idea undisclosed event and a rhythm measured in long world of time. It is in cycles of time that span the epochs, the yugas are measured constantly. And a rhythm measured a long world of time. Now, undisclosed event is of course reminiscent of the divine event which is there on the very first page. Exactly, I was just looking. Line 3. <laughs> <laughs> the divine event, the mm -hmm. opening That's mind. Right. Line, the second line. 1.1. 1. 1. Okay, yeah, yes. No. 
Forgetful of a spirit and a fate. Now all, all these things are connected. You see here, they are, they are, they are <laughs> not uh, just for the day. You see, you see. Now of course we know across the path, the divine event, and he talks of your uh, same thing, undisclosed event. Mm -hmm. See now here uh, in this picture we have already very clearly. Uh, this picture is very close to what we are seeing here. Mm -hmm. uh, the one point six. Athwar vain enormous trance of space is formed as stupor without mind or life. <laughs> See? A shadow is spinning to a soul is void, thrown back once more into unthinking dreams, earth will be abandoned in the hollow girls, forgetful of spirit and of fate. The impassive skies were neutral, empty. Still, so we have got the same description here in a certain sense. You see, mm -hmm. I've told back once more. Means yeah, not the first time it happened. No, it's not the first time. Once more, exactly. Once, once more. more. That's right. That's right. Again. Yeah. yeah. That's told right. back again. Yeah. 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 It, it, it happened. It happened. This. I have a question regarding the, the, the opening of something. This. Darkness, this void, is already a first manifestation. It's a pre-manifestation. You can say uh, you can say the first manifestation in a certain sense. In a certain sense. In a certain sense. It's not wrong to say that. You see, after all, it is the Supreme Himself who has emptied Himself out, and that is the first manifestation. Yes. Mm. First, yeah. But now, the, the, you could say that that is the basis for things to happen further. Exactly. So you take that thing as a zero point, and then say first manifestation, second man. The first manifestation after that void is the inconscience. Yes. In that, yes. but what do you say is true? In fact, he says up to nothingness. Is. The first and the last nothing is on the very first page. Mm -hmm. On the very first page, he says uh, uh, the first and the last nothing is. See, a fathom is okay. Let us read this thing. A fathom is zero occupied the world. Shunya. 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 Zero occupied. A power of foreign, boundless self awake between the first and the last. Nothingness. Yeah, this is. Finding. Uh, <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> and all those in between. But you see, <coughs> but you see, in two sentences, he has kind of summarized the whole of life divide. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's the power of poetry. You see. Now, what he says is a power of fallen, boundless self away. He talks of self. Self is the part corresponding to consciousness or being. Being. Power corresponds to the aspect of consciousness force. Shakti. So the being has plunged here into the void and it is his power which is taking things forward. He is now sleeping there. And she has to carry on the work. So the work is being carried out by the power. And he is only the support, the mm -hmm. adhara, the base for things to happen. Mm. For things to happen. A power of fallen, boundless self, he is already boundless. 
Between the first and the last, nothing will. What is the first nothingness? This is of course what we are saying in the last nothing, where he has totally emptied himself out. The first nothingness is the absolute, the non-manifest, the inevitable, which is not the total non-manifest. And the last nothingness? But also empty of the That's mind. empty. He empty is there, the but he has not brought out anything out. Therefore, he is empty. Hmm. But why there is a nothingness after? There is, so, it is because he has not brought himself out in any way. He has totally remained within himself. But it's not blissful. Huh? It's not, it is not blissful. <laughs> it may be blissful. <laughs> but the divine is full of bliss in himself and manifest but blissful in no, his No, he has not brought out any quality. He is there, <laughs> self himself. <laughs> so, whether it is in bliss or uh, agony or suffering, <laughs> that also we don't know. We can't no, say no. that. No. no. Can, can we say that? Can we say that the divine is able to create an empty divine? Almost. Yeah, well, th this, is, uh, this is what it wants. See, basically, basically, th there are three stages. One is the uh, absolute or the total non manifest. Total non manifest. Nothing of it has come out. The Indian word for non manifest or absolute is a vector who has not expressed himself in any way. Vector. He has not expressed himself anywhere in any way. That is the nothingness. Now, out of that, then the last nothingness came. He emptied himself out again, so to say. And he became the opposite of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, th that is the, that's a little, uh, as I said, we'll come back again, <laughs> again, again to that. Yeah. But, but when he says again, once more, it. it now, that is from, now from the last nothingness, from the void. Is this, has that something to do with the pralaya? Exactly. Ah, okay. Exactly. Okay. This is this is the uh, seventh creation, as the mother says. There were six pralayas, yes. and this ah. is the seventh creation. Seventh. So they, they each take yeah. endless yeah. amount of That's right. And the mother said that this creation, uh, of course, I mean, she has said, she even also said in one of his letters that uh, this there will be no more pralaya afterwards. Mm -hmm. This is the last step, he said. And obviously, <laughs> we can say, because the supermind has now descended, when that thing is here now, there is no question of pralaya or dissolution. Exactly. It may go through difficult stages and all that, but there is no question of dissolution now. So, no more nothingness. No more dissolution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the last thing. Actually, we are safe now. <laughs> yeah. This is why, I don't know. I've always, whenever I read this first passage here, I've always understood that between the first and the last nothing, nothingness, it's almost like the mind of this unconscious expecting that there will be another nothingness. It's not necessarily the divine. No, whatever you want to call it. Basically, the, the, the creator or whatever you want to call it, it, it is something who has not manifested at all. Mm -hmm. That is the first nothingness. Yeah, yeah. First nothing. The last nothing may say, after manifestation, he has become Satchitananda, he has become over mind, he has become this, 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 etc., etc., and emptied himself out totally and became the last nothingness. Okay. Okay. Ah, yes. Again, nothing. For the purposes of a creation. So it's all, all, all for nothing. <laughs> for nothing. For nothing. <laughs> no, no, that is no, important. No. You see, no. that he emptying himself out is important. See, for instance, if he does not empty himself out, and suppose there is a creation in Satchitananda, in fact there are creations in Satchitananda yes, also, course, in the transcendent, so <laughs> there are, there are. Now, the point, the trouble there is, I mean, uh, there is no real separation, there is no division between this and that, because everybody knows everything. It's, it's kind of open secret to everybody. <laughs> there is no concretization, there is no individualization of things. The individualization, if it has to take place, it can happen only by separating yourself from that thing totally. Yeah. And this is the process of individualization, mm -hmm. of emptying yourself out fully, become the last nothingness, and start as individuals. As individuals. So, if you want the individualization to take place, perhaps this is the only process by which things can happen. So last, nothing, last nothingness would again relate to pralaya? 
No, now it is over. That's the last. The last one is over now. Doesn't happen again. Now, now Not for yeah. our universe. Yeah, yeah. But it refers to pertaining to our universe, our, our, universe. our creation. Our creation. Our the creation. Whole creation. Our whole means creation. There may be more universes. Yeah, whatever. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> you see, later on, of course, there are many questions. All right, Earth is a significant center. Earth will do, etc., etc. Evolution takes place. Then, may, there are many questions also. What happens to the other material objects in the yeah, sky? Exactly. Shivanu says that we should see later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he will lie when he says about that, you see. At the moment, the concern is the evolutionary process on the earth. In other words, there will be other, they are there not for nothing. All these millions and millions of stars or whatever objects are there, they are not there for nothing. Each one may have its own individual characteristic which has to come out in its divine way. And that can happen when things on the earth get established first. So that becomes the significant center from that angle. If a certain star has its own character, in order to bring out that full divine quality of it, is a possibility. And that possibility can materialize when things happen first on the earth. So in that sense, earth is really uh, a significant center. Geocentricity has a, <laughs> a real, real meaning from that angle. But that is a, that is a spiritual geocentricity, not the physical. Okay, now uh, he says, we are going back to our uh, <coughs> Amid the ambiguous stillness of the stars, obviously, ambiguous stillness of the stars, she moved to some undisclosed event and her rhythm measured a long world of time. Long, obviously, through various stages, she has to go on and on and on, you see, world of time, cyclic time, difficulties. In serious motion round the purple rim, Purple. See, she would use the word purple, purposefully. <laughs> see, purple is the color of royalty, is the color of life force, vitality. Purple, vitality, life force. It is that which has to get first actuated in creation. Vitality. In fact, uh, you must have heard of no purple is the color of majesty, of royalty, of the richness of greatness, uh, powerful sails of Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you heard of that? Yeah. Uh, on the Nile, her boat is uh, decorated with purple sails, you see. That's the color of royalty, of richness, of life, you see. East of dress. Pardon? The east of dress in the Roman church. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Purple rim. See, each word has all those uh, the richness is connotations. In serious motion round the purple rim, day after day, sped by, sped by like colored spokes. So as if it is a wheel, it spokes there, and day after each, each day, means the universe, this wheel has uh, 365 spokes, you see. <laughs> In serious motion round the purple rim, day after day sped by like colored spoon, and through a glamour of shifting hues of air, constantly the scene is changing. Today is golden, tomorrow is purple, tomorrow is uh, mm -hmm. orange, red, it keeps on changing constantly. Glamour, attraction, charm, beauty, love, see, all those things are there in the glamour. And through a glamour of shifting hues of air, the seasons do in link the significant dance. So they are moving as if in a dance, all the seasons, going around in rotation. The symbol pageant of the changing year. So this is the pageant. This is the uh, way in which the things unroll here. It is a sort of an illustration. The symbolic pageant of the changing year. Changing year is not the uh, year which is changing, but 
within the year all the cycles are changing constantly mm -hmm. changing year in other words uh, it is uh, the changing year changing is uh, an adjective for year which is what is called mm -hmm. the uh, what is the technical word it corresponds to the symbol, the pageant, changing pageant of the year. No, the seasons. Basically, yeah, it yeah, means. Yeah. Uh, transferred metaphor, transferred adjective. This this adjective is called a transferred adjective. It belongs to actually the pageant and not to year. It is changing pageant of the year. This, this, this uh, poetical, you say, poetic technique is called a transferred epithet. Mm -hmm. Why? The year also keeps changing. No, it's, 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 okay. that's a poetic technique. That's way of saying it is not the year which is changing, mm -hmm. it is the patient which is changing. Yeah. You got it or uh, difficulty? Mm -hmm. It's called transferred epithet. Mm -hmm. well, I won't remember that word. <laughs> Pardon? I won't remember that word. Transferred epithet. The symbol pageant of the changing year. You see, year is a singular year, see. Yeah. But within that year, it is changing. Yeah, but what is changing? Not the year. It is the pageant which is changing. Year is not changing from the seasons? No, no year, year, year is year. <laughs> year. <laughs> 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 it is the pageant it's of the year. The same. But they're all a year. I can be changing, yeah. no, I stay myself, but I'm changing. Yeah, yeah. That's happens to be here. That's the transfer day. Here is a kind of a fixed thing, a pattern. It consists of all these things. It consists of all these things. But within that year, things are changing. Exactly. Yeah. So it is that, that thing which is a pageant which is changing. You see. So width is always a different uh, part of the year. See, you, 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 you can take a simple example, the changing day. Now, you have got morning, afternoon, evening, etc. No, the, it is not the day which is changing, it is the thing within this day which is changing. <laughs> the changes that make the day. Yeah. Yeah, one yeah, well, can say that. Anyway, this is, this is, this is, this is a poetic technique of what is called a transferred epithet. Then comes across the burning languor of the soil. Now the description of the season proper begins. After this introduction, <laughs> after the introduction, you can take another copy. Across the burning languor of the soil, languor, the, the soil is lying listless without any activity, dull, so to say. Burning, still very hot, of course, day. Paste summer. It is palm of violent noons. So now here, summer means uh, noon afternoon, day after day. It means obviously violent noon and stamped the tyranny of torrid light and the blue seal of a great burnished sky. Sky is it polished, clear, absolutely buffed. You know, buffing after buffing, you get shine of the uh, metals, you know, vessels. <laughs> Then comes the description of the rain tide. It's one of the longest descriptions of the rain tide. Mm. 44 lines. <laughs> well, let me first read uh, what we have in Kalidasa's translation uh, about the rain. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll, describe, we'll read these 44 lines. He says, the rain advances like a king. King? King. Like a king. King. The way the king yeah, yeah. advances. In that manner, the rain is advancing. His army, his retinue, or whatever you call it, they are moving and he is going on, you see. Army. The rain advances like a king in awful majesty. With all his pomp and glory, the rain is going. Here, dearest, how his thunders ring. The way in which the thunders rain, here that thing he is telling to his beloved. Here, dearest, 
how his thunder rain, thunders rain, means that king of the rain, ring, like a royal drums, the way the drums ring, like royal drum, and see his lightning banners wave. When the king is moving, the banners are moving around like that. You imagine the procession of the king with all these things, you see. So his lightning banners wave, a cloud for elephant, he rides. Who is the vehicle of the king? The elephant. And that elephant is nothing but a cloud, you see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a cloud for elephant, he rides and finds his welcome from the crowd. Everybody around him, they welcome him. The king, you see, welcome. Uh, from the crowd of lovers and of brides. Who are in the crowd? The lovers and the brides. Mm. They, they are welcoming him. You see. <laughs> so that is how Kalidas would describe the rainy season. He is moving like a king, Raja, you see with all the retinue. Now here, we have a totally different kind of a picture in Savitri. Next, through his fiery swoon or plotted knot, rain tide burst, sorry, rain tide burst in upon tall wings of heat as if the wings have been torn off by the heat. See, the moment there is rain, then suddenly you have the less heat, as if the wings of heat have been torn. Mm -hmm. Somewhere here, somewhere there, somewhere there, not everywhere. It breaks the heat. Yeah, very picturesque. Rain tide burst in upon torn wings of heat, startled with lightnings, airs, unquiet drowse. The air was not, now it's not quiet anymore. Unquiet drowse. Lashes. Life giving strain the torpid soil, overcast with flare and sound and storm and dark. The star defended toes of heavens dim sleep, or from the gold eye of a paramour covered with packed cloud waves, the earth's brown face. So, earth is the paramour of the lover. Or from the gold eye of her paramour, of her paramour, covered with packed cloud veils. See, mm -hmm. somewhere here there will be cloud veils, and it is covered. Well, the earth's brown face. This is the description of the paramour. Now, there is a, there is a uh, very interesting reference to paramour. <laughs> In Shakespeare's Midsummer's Night, Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm. <laughs> yeah, he talks out very interestingly there. Certainly, he is the smartest working man in Athens. He is describing a person in Athens, he is smartest. That person in Athens. Certainly, he is the smartest working man in Athens. Yes, the best looking. And his voice is a paramour of sweetness. Mm. The, this man's voice is a paramour of sweetness. Very, very delicate, very beautiful simile, you see. He's so loving, so charming. And as you are lower, the sweetness and his speech, the voice, <coughs> as you are lower of each other, you see. And his voice is the paramour of sweetness. <laughs> so, you know, you know the, they look very abstract, voice and uh, sweetness, but then they have become concrete and they have become lovers of each other, you see. <laughs> Overcast with flare and sound and storming the dark. The star defended toes of heavens dim sleep, of, or from the gold eye of her paramour, covered with packed cloud waves, there's brown face. Armies of revolution crowd the time field. Now, monsoon, when it comes in gusts, day after day, day after day, it gives on. Army. In fact, the whole simile now from these two sentences is a simile of a battlefield. 
army is of revolution crowd the time see the clouds unending march besiege the world tempest runs the mountains claim the sky and thunder drums announce the battle goes so now it is the battle cry which is being heard from cementos that is the proclamation of yes i am the master now here that is the proclamation announcement yes i have come i am the master everything is my position now from cementos see is one of the biggest words in savitri <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> and of course the distress falls on mentors pronounce mentors is it pronounce mentors It looks like Italian. I mean, it looks Italian. Come from Latin. No, it's Spanish. Both Spanish. Both Spanish. Italian yeah. come from Latin, no? Latin, Spanish. Actually, you must have heard pronunciamentos of uh, uh, Spanish Civil War, nineteen thirty-six. Mm -hmm. They made a declaration. Mm -hmm. Yes, the rebellions. They come and yeah. declare. You see. Both yeah. Spanish. Yeah. Tempest pronunciamentos claim the sky, and thunder means there was this kind of a rebellious march going on, and they are going to conquer the thing, great, and thunder drums announce the battle of gods. All the gods are now trapped in that. They are on. A traveler from unquiet neighboring seas. He is a traveler coming from unquiet, the seas turbulent in the rainy season, and he is coming there. From the neighboring, from neighboring seas, the dense made monsoon road rain through us hours. <laughs> Our longest line is Savitri. <laughs> <laughs> to utter that whole line in one breath is difficult. <laughs> the dense made monsoon road rain through us hours. See. Here you got all all are practically monosyllabic words except to monsoon and main, mm -hmm. and he's coming like a horse with his main tossed around. Mm -hmm. Dense main monsoon road main through us hours. Take now the emissary javelins, mission javelins. They have been given in Kanpur mm -hmm. town. And all the lightning split the horizon's rim. Then what happens at night? And hurl from quarters as from contending caps. Married heavens edges steep and bare and blind. It surged and hissed and onset of huge rain. The long straight sleet had dipped. Clamorous of wind storms in charge, throngs of wind faces, rushing of wind feet, hurrying swept through the prone, afflicted plains. Heaven's waters trail and dribble to the drowned land. <laughs> That is how the rains come. You see, it's incredible. How How he paints with the sounds. Yeah, sound also. Yeah. The images given. And see how many big words he has used. At the same time, each one is practically monosyllabic and very heavy words, bringing the density of monsoon. Mm -hmm. All the words are see clamors of wind, storm, charge, monosyllabic everything. Mm -hmm. Trust. Throngs of wind faces, rushing of wind feet. See. Hurrying step through the prone, afflicted place. The place are lying, but then they are rushing to the place. Heaven's waters trail and dribble to the drowned land. Drop it, let it come in. Then all with a swift stride, a sibilant raise, or all was turned to shout and waters fall. There is the tempest of the waters fall causing a dimness sagged on the great floor of day. So that is how the rays are coming down, and now on the floor of the day, 
is in the sprawling land joined morn to eve so whole day from morning to evening goes on the raining all is in the sprawling land joined morn to eve valuing in sludge and shower it reached black dark day a half darkness wore as is dull dress so that is the dress of the day light looked into dawn's tarnished glass that is what happened to look into the glass it is tarnished glass or dark tarnished glass and met his own face there yes have become dark here that is what the light says twin to a half lit night so he has become now a twin to night itself night is half lit day is also practically dark because of rain and clouds down for a drip and seeping mist swayed all and turned dry soil to bog and reeking mud heard <laughs> for a quick mire heaven a dismal block none saw through dank the drench to weeks the dungeon sun through week out of week is all over us clouds rain we don't see the sun at all so the sun is as if imprisoned in the cell there in the dungeon none saw through dank drench to weeks the dungeon sun even when no turmoil vexed air's somber rest or a faint ray glimmered through weeping clouds as a sad smile gleams veiled by returning tears all promised brightness failed at once denied or soon condemned died like a brief lived hope the way the hope which is very very fragile so to say dies very shortly in a short time or soon condemned died like a brief lived mean sometimes you see sunlight suddenly and suddenly it again disappears because of the clouds and all that this same we have seen last time as a sad smile gleams veiled by returning tears is a very delicate kind of simile a sad smile is returning is gleaming to the veil of the clouds I think we read all these passages together. This rainy summer and rain together. <laughs> all right. Uh, the reason, the reason is difficult to. No, we'll we'll try to, to get. You you do it very well. <laughs> no, uh, we will go on together. Whatever possible. <laughs> you are you are you are hesitant. Well, we can do. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. We can try. I will. I will read in low voice. Let me let me hear your voices. <laughs> a crowd, a burning languor, or a soil. Faced summer with his form of violent noons, and stamped his tyranny of torrid light, and the blue sea of a great burnished sky. Next to his fiery swoon or clotted knot. Rain tide burst in upon torn wings of heat, startled with lightning's airs, unquiet drows, lashed with life-giving streams, the torrid soil, overcast with flare and sound and storm-winged dark, the star-defended doors of heaven's dim sleep. Of the gold eye of her paramour, covered with packed cloud veils, the earth's brown face. Armies of revolution crossed the time field. The clouds' unending march besieged the world. Tempests burned the windows, claimed the sky. And thunder drums announced the embattled gods. A traveller from unquiet neighbouring seas, the dense maned monsoon roared neigh through earth's hours, 
Thick now the emissary javelins, enormous lightnings split the horizon's rim, and hurled from the quarters as from contending camps, married heaven's edges, steep and bare and blind, a surge and hiss, an onset of huge rain, the long straight sleep drift, clamors of wind storm charge, through the wind faces, rushing of wind feet, hurrings swept through the broad afflicted plains, heaven's waters trailed and dribbled through the drowned land. And then all was a swift stride, a similar race, or all was tempest shout and waters fall, and a dimness sagged on the grey floor of day, its dingy sprawling length joined morn to eve, wellowing in sludge and shower if reached black dark. A half hour darkness wore as its stunning dress. Light looked into dawn's tarnished glass and met its own face there, twinned to a half lit night, downpour and drip and seeping mist swayed all and turned the dry soil to bog and reeking mud. Earth was a quagmire, heaven a dismal block. None saw through dank, drenched weeds the dungeon sun. Even when no turmoil vexed air's somber rest, or a faint ray glimmered through weeping clouds, as a sad smile gleams veiled by the turning tears. All promised brightness failed at once, denied, or soon condemned, died like a brief lived hope. <laughs> so that is how the discussion goes on. Where is this? When you when you read, there is a song. You have to read the sound. It's like a song. So, <laughs> song. Yeah, 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 Rain, there's one sign that's left. There's one more. 9350? Yeah. Yeah. 16. 16, yeah. <coughs> of only a whisper and green dust of trees. No, then oh, a last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the last one. Yeah, right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Last one. Then a last massive deluge crash. Dead Meyer. Dead Meyer. Then a last massive deluge. Crash, dead mire, and a, sub and a subsiding mutter left is still all still, or only the muddy creep of sinking floods, or only a whisper and green toss of trees. Well, uh, yeah, that's right. Yes, uh, summer, of, uh, I'm sorry, rainy season ends with 93.16. Yes. Yeah. Then I was more still, yeah. 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 Here we have got, you can get some help from here. Then a last massive deluge crash, dead mire, dead mire, it, both of them are stress rebels, responding, it uses certain power, straight away, see. Then a last massive deluge crash, dead mire, and a subsiding matter left all still, see that, Contemplate all still, both of them are stress level, all still, or only the muddy creep of sinking floods, 
or only a whisper and green tusk of trees? Pardon? Yeah, it goes. Yeah. It goes like that. Yeah. Or only a whisper and green tusks of trees. It goes up and down. Same way, you see, if you see the whole passage also, long sentences, short sentences, very long sentences. See, it has a certain kind of a rhythm in the inspiration. The inspiration also moves in certain rhythm. This is the same edition, but with uh, accent marks. This is a slightly smaller uh, print. So we meet uh, on Saturdays at four thirty. All right. Oh no, we skip Tuesdays completely. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. I will. You want to?